Welcome back, Mike Check. This is part two, chapter 13. <laughs> so the rest of the chapter is pretty much a review of that big chart. Um, and it's nice to review that thing uh, because at first it's, it's kind of daunting to see like all those abbreviations and and uh, anterior versus posterior and all that stuff. So pituitary gland, there's a front and there's a back, anterior lobe, posterior lobe. Uh, don't worry about adeno or neurohypothesis. Just know there's an anterior lobe and a posterior lobe. And uh, of course, uh, homeostasis uh, controlled by uh, hypothalamus. If you look here, again, base of the skull uh, and a lot of other nerves and a lot of uh, other things surrounding it. Um, so when you look at it here, the anterior lobe is much bigger than the posterior lobe and because we know that majority of the if you're lost, the majority of the hormones, like there's like six or seven of them in the anterior, and there's only two in the posterior. And of course, there's a lot of innervation of uh, um, arteries and veins, and it makes sense because of course they're endocrine and they have to be released into the blood supply. So the anterior pituitary, anterior, anterior pituitary. Growth hormone is GH, prolactin, PRL, and these are universal um, uh, abbreviations that you see in most textbooks. Thyroid stimulating hormone, adrenocorticotrophic hormone, um, no one calls it that, everyone calls it ACTH, and you have FSH and LH. And these, are, these are the major ones, these are, again, uh, more uh, the more common. Of course, growth hormone. And we talk, uh, we're gonna, um, this is the thing that we were talking about how you have primary messengers or first messengers and second uh, second messengers. So for example, for growth, um, uh, for growth hormone, you're gonna have growth hormone releasing hormone. Then it's gonna tell what? The growth hormone to do, to release. Somatostatin, we already know, tells it to do what? Stop. Now, if the growth hormone gets activated, what will it activate on? Bone, muscle, and also I, forget, I failed to mention, it also acts upon adipose tissue because adipose tissue, what does adipose tissue store that we need? Why do we have fat? Sugar, glucose, and I need that to grow and I need it for uh, the bone to remodel. I need it for the muscle. Um, um, to contract. So you could see here how stuff from a hypothalamus then goes to an anterior to anterior pituitary and then to the target. So you could look at it this way: growth hormone releasing or GHRH uh, stimulates growth hormone. Growth hormone then uh, does its uh, does its effects on bone, muscle, and adipose tissue. And of course, somatostatin also released from the hypothalamus will now do what? Um, inhibit that. Prolactin, of course, inhibited by prolactin. You know what? It's much better to look at this picture. So everything up here, think hypothalamus. Everything down here, anterior pituitary. Everything down here is target tissue. Isn't that the, isn't that the two kind of questions that I stated that uh, this particular chapter would yield? Do you know the source? And do you know where it's headed and, and, and what are its actions? So let's look at the next one. Prolactin inhibiting hormone. Of course, it's going to tell prolactin to do what? Stop. But when a baby comes, hormones from the anterior pituitary, the prolactin will then stimulate the mammary gland for, of course, milk production. Th uh, thyrotropin releasing hormone. Of course, that messes with thyroid stimulating hormone. And then it will activate the thyroid gland. And then the two um, hormones that we talked about, and T3 and T4, thyroid stimulating hormone, T3 and T4, 
that's part of your thyroid profile. And every time there's a cardiac problem, anytime there's a metabolism problem, uh, or unexplained weight loss, that kind of thing, we always do a thyroid uh, panel, which um, is TSH, and of course, uh, the thyroid itself, T3 and T4 hormones. Corticotropin releasing hormone, CRH, of course, in the hypothalamus, activates ACTH, and we know the adrenal cortex. And I like the way your textbook draws, draws the adrenal cortex. It looks like a little A. And it reminds me that that A has to sit on top of your kidneys. Gonadotropin releasing hormone, GNRH. We know that gonads are sex hormones. So LH, FSH, think uh, they, they have uh, effects on both ovaries and testes. Uh, FSH is more specific to testes, but both LH and FSH uh, affect the uh, ovaries regarding uh, ovulation. This picture right here is golden. Um, I, I could do... I, I could do like uh, half the quiz just on this picture alone because you have source, you have first messengers, second messengers, and then you have um, uh, um, target organs, which is a classic endocrine, endocrine uh, type of question. Oh, by the way, all of these words are simply um, um, you know, word um, bullet versions of this picture. So this picture is golden. Posterior pituitary, remember there's only two, ADH and oxytocin. ADH is also known as vasopressin because we know that antidiuretic hormone also deals with uh, blood pressure because if I tell my kidneys, hold the water, do not pee, what's gonna happen to my blood pressure? Is it going to go up or is it going to go down? It's going to go up. Remember, more water, it's going to go up. Or think of uh, the water pill that your family member gets. What do they do all day if you get a water pill? You pee. Now, if you pee a lot, what will happen to your blood pressure? It will go down. <laughs> Oxytocin, we already know. Uterine, uh, uterine wall to childbirth, and it has this extra... Uh, milk injection during uh, lactation it's, uh, because it makes sense. If baby's going to come out, what's baby going to need almost immediately? Milk. So this is a beautiful both A and B right here. Thyroid gland. We of course have lateral lobes. As you can see here, like little bat wings. Just below, just below your larynx or your voice box. And of course, T, T4, T3. And then calcitonin, we already know, deals with what? Calcium, right? And um, calcium production and calcium tone or tonicity. And T3, T4, I want you to think metabolism, heart rate. Um, 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 there are a whole, there's a subset of um, differential diagnosis for people They come in, they think they're having a heart attack. And then we do um, a thyroid panel. The T3, T4, and TSH are up, meaning what? Their metabolism is up. So they're not really having a heart attack, but they feel like they're having it. And by differential diagnosis, I mean the diagnosis is your state or condition of complete or thorough knowledge. Your differential diagnosis is all these other things that could be that. Like, for example, you come in with chest pain. Uh, like, Especially if you're in your 50s, sedentary lifestyle, hypertensive, um, uh, pre-diabetic, odds are you're having a heart attack, right? But I got to check out all these other tests because could it be just chest pain? Could it be GERD, severe GERD, gastroesophageal reflux disease? Yeah. Could it be a panic attack? Yep. Could it be T3? Um, could it be a thyroid problem like thyroiditis? Right? If I had an inflammation or infection in my thyroid, don't you think my thyroid would kick up a storm? Actually, that's what they call it, a thyroid storm. Right? And then all of that will look like a what? It'll look and act like a heart attack. Anyone here have a panic attack here? Didn't it hurt? Like, it, and you have the squeezing of the chest, 
and you can't breathe, all right, and you're panicking, just like um, feeling of impending doom of a typical uh, acute myocardial uh, um, infarction. infarction patient, AMI. Thank you for helping me with that last one. All right, it's all, and that's actually the challenge of our jobs because it kind of looks like it, but that's why we do tests and, and so on and so forth. Uh, T3, T4, and of course, who activates T3, T4? TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone. And calcitonin, what's calcitonin gonna do for us? I have too much calcium, what's it gonna do? It's gonna <laughs> tone down my calcium. And of course, anytime you think about calcium, you're also thinking about phosphate, just as a side note. But I'll always ask about calcium, so think, Calcitonin, I got way too much calcium. So what am I gonna do? I'm gonna ramp up my metabolism to get rid of it or to tone it down. Um, these are disorders, uh, they're not part of um, uh, the lecture, so I'm gonna uh, move through them, but um, hyperthyroidism, hypothyroidism, it's easy to kind of know what they are. Hyper means what? Too much. So if you had too much TSH, T3, T4, what are you gonna be? You're gonna be ramped up, aren't you, all right? It's gonna be like you did, uh, you know, you did some sort of uh, amphetamine-like drug. You'll be talking a mile a minute. You'll have unexplained weight loss. You can't go to sleep, <coughs> right? And hypothyroid, don't you think you'll have the exact opposite? If your metabolism got dropped, what do you feel like? You feel like what, taking a nap? Hypothyroid patient even talks like this. Hey, doctor. They talk like that, very slow. They move very slow because everything about their metabolism has now, what? Decreased because there's decreased TSH, decreased T3, T4. Here's a, a hyperthyroidism and the classic is uh, exophthalmus. When the uh, eyes get um, um, start protruding out of its uh, eye sockets, this is not too bad. I'm seeing one. This is a goiter. Again, if my gland here gets out of control, what will happen? I could have inflammation or infection of that as well. Next, parathyroid. PTH. <laughs> Anytime you think of calcium, always think in the back of your mind phosphate. Um, but calcium is our number one concern. So parathyroid hormone, what will it do? Remember calcitonin will tone down my calcium. But what do parathyroid hormone will do, right? It will do what? The exact opposite. It'll ramp it up. So parathyroid hormone and calcitonin, don't you think it's going to be one of those questions where you're going to be going, is it increase, decrease? So what are you going to do? Memorize one like your life depended on it, and now you know which one I memorized. I always think calcitonin will tone the calcium down. And then PTH is just the exact opposite. Okay, And of course, what will a parathyroid uh, do? Kidneys, intestines, because and uh, if you learn it like a story, where do I get calcium from? I got it from bone. So don't you think the parathyroid hormone has to tell the bone, hey, break up a little bit. And we already know who breaks up bone. Osteoclast. So the osteoclast will do what? Start breaking up bone, start releasing calcium. What's also another way I can get calcium? Don't you think I could go outside and get vitamin D? We already learned that in skin. What's another way I can get calcium? Don't you think I could just simply eat more milk and cheese products? And if I eat more and more, if I eat more milk and cheese products, don't you think I have to signal my small intestine to do what? Hey, I need more calcium, so what do I need to do? I need to intake more, uh, absorb more calcium. So if you learn that story, that story has three parts, right? One is the bone, one is the kidney, one is the small intestine. Then you know the story. Does that look like a beautiful all of the above? Does that look like what are the actions of PTH on your kidney? Will you increase or decrease your calcium? Increase absorption. What are your actions on the bone? Will you keep calcium or will you break down bone to release calcium? Will break down bone to release calcium, right? And it goes well. It goes um, 
if my patient goes outside, what's going to uh, need to also happen? More vitamin D synthesis, right? From the UV and more conversion to calcium. And who always goes with calcium? Now we know phosphate. So how's this? An osteoporosis, right? I'm losing a whole bunch of calcium. What else am I also going to lose? Phosphate. What makes the bone hard? We definitely know calcium. Who's the buddy? Phosphate. So now you know both calcium and phosphate make bone or compact bone hard. And now you know what osteoporosis can do to you. Now you know what parathyroid will do. Parathyroid hormone does what? Increase or decreases calcium? Increase. Calcitonin will do what? Tone the calcium down. And there's your parathyroid gland. It is, of course, on the side or alongside your thyroid. Now you know what the thyroid does. Now you know what the parathyroid does. Oh, here's another reminder of other ways I can get calcium. I get it through food, intestinal enzymes. Oh, look, vitamin D. And we already know vitamin D deals with calcium, deals with also the conversion of calcium from my skin as well. We already know that liver stores a whole bunch of fat. Well, it'll do other things too. And now we know uh, that parathyroid hormone also deals with uh, kidney. So you can have this picture, intestines, sunlight, diet, kidney. Don't you have it all? Yep. And it's just one big picture. I like this picture better than uh, that previous explanation. And of course, you have hyperparathyroidism, uh, hypoparathyroid, what would you have? Hyper would be what? Too much calcium. And remember, too much of a good thing becomes a bad thing. And hypoparathyroidism, um, we of course infuse it with calcium, and then uh, you also have to uh, have uh, vitamin D, you gotta go in the sun more, and you have to increase your diet, so on and so forth. Adrenal glands. You kind of know where they are. Here are your kidneys. It's that artificially colored blue stuff, this thing here. And of course, it has a cortex and it has a medullary area, just like your kidney. They're also known as suprarenal glands. They sit on top of each kidney. And uh, uh, what does the adrenal cortex do? Think what? Aldosterone, cortisol, sex hormones, and uh, adrenal medulla. Think epinephrine, norepinephrine, or um, yeah, okay? And you can look at it this way, or you can look at the chart, or go home, draw this picture, and draw arrows from the adrenal cortex, and uh, uh, write the like norepi, epi um, abbreviations, whatever, which way you get the need that need to get that into your head. Please do so by Thursday's quiz, and definitely by Monday's exam. Um, aldosterone we already went over, cortisol we kind of went over, and it goes. And what's the big thing about uh, uh, cortisol? And look, glucose synthesis, and it makes sense. If I'm stressed out over a long period of time, don't you think I'm going to need energy to deal with that stress? Right? That's cortisol. Now, if I need energy right now because uh, I'm about to get hit by a car, Who's going to do it? Who, because uh, what makes you wake up, right? You ever been sleepy on the highway? Maybe tonight when you're going home, you're like, and then you hit a cone, and then you do what? That's adrenaline. Or it goes epinephrine. It's called adrenaline in the um, in, uh, United Kingdom. Here in the United States, we call it epinephrine. And epinephrine will do what? Give you that bolt of energy, just enough for you to uh, deal with your fight or flight. But then, of course, after a while, it wears off. Uh, adrenal androgens, of course. Sex hormones. Remember I told you about my, pa uh, my patient, ACTH. My patient was taking exogenous steroids and in the form of adrenal androgens because he wanted to get bigger and bulk up, but it's going to ruin your kidneys, it's going to ruin your liver, and it's going to ruin your adrenal glands. All in one shot. We already talked about the pancreas. Now, when you look at where the pancreas actually is, right behind the stomach, 
connected directly to your first part of your small intestine, which is your duodenum. Perfect place because isn't this where all the food is going to come out here in the stomach, right? And isn't that the, isn't that the signal of uh, that I ate a big meal when this gets distended or when, the, when something enters the stomach? And if I have a big meal, what's going to get released? What's going to get released? Insulin, right? Yeah, well, eventually glucose. But insulin to do what? That big meal has glucose in it. So I can now get the glucose where? Inside the cell where it belongs. And glucagon, what's it gonna do? Tell my liver to break down glycogen to make me what? Glucose, and that's called glycogenolysis, right? Uh, 25 cent word, but now you know what it means. So what are we doing in glucagon? I wanna increase my blood glucose. What am I doing in insulin? I wanna decrease my blood glucose. And of course, the amount of statin, right? Uh, Regulation of carbohydrates, but it, it, it's kind of like a balance thing. But for a pancreas, the two things I need for you to know is glucagon, glucagon and insulin. When did they get released and what happens when they get released? Now here are the extra glands, the et cetera glands, but they're important as well. Pineal gland uh, secretes melatonin and that's for your circadian rhythm, day and night cycles. Those of us who like work in the day uh, and then switch um, um, uh, switch schedules know that it's sometimes hard the first the first week. Uh, it's sometimes hard to get to know when day and night is. But then your body will do what? And uh, maybe you've heard of this uh, substance here, melatonin. Uh, it is known to uh, uh, help you with sleep. But melatonin, the data is what they call anecdotal meaning that there is no scientific data to support melatonin, but there's so many patients, like hundreds of thousands of them, who still take melatonin, and they claim that it works for them, and it's barely above baseline for a, um, uh, what do they call that? Um, what's that term? Sugar pill? Placebo. The way we figure out if a drug works or not is if we give a whole bunch of patients a placebo and we tell them it's real. Right, um, because your brain can do wondrous things if you can trick it. Well, melatonin, uh, many of the case studies state that melatonin has is nominal effects versus uh, placebo. So I could give you a sugar pill, go, hey, this is melatonin, this will help you go to sleep, and you'll 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 go to sleep as as well as you would take melatonin. But I, I had a lot of I, I had a lot of patients, especially the ones who didn't. Um, they didn't like um, um, they didn't like any narcotics or especially Ambien uh, or any of the they're called angiolytic drugs. They're very addictive. They're not and they're really not good for you. And actual, if you know your pineal gland controls your day night cycles, what can you do? And one or oh, one of the things that they always mention in um, uh, they call it core classes here. Did, did they mention that you guys need to get sleep? Yes? Did they mention how? One of those things is, like if you're studying, if you know you have to sleep at 11 o'clock or midnight, stop studying at 11. Already have a process of winding down. Like uh, me, um, because I don't want to take meds, I actually, even if I'm not sleepy, I sit in a, it goes, uh, for me, in a dark room with, you know, with really, really light background ambient noise playing. If any of you have like, uh, um, like uh, any of those apps, those sleeping apps, mm -hmm. sometimes I just want like a little bit background noise and then and and then fall asleep. The days that the days that I don't fall asleep are the days that I'm binge watching something or I'm doing work, right? And I'm doing, trying to go to sleep. Then you can't. Then you're thinking about work. Then you get up and then you go back and do the work anyway. Then you realize it's 5:30 in the morning and the day has to start again. So knowing how, knowing that you have a circadian sleep uh, day night cycle, and um, unfortunately we're in one of those businesses, I had um, nursing staff that used to change schedules every two weeks. So you could be day or night and, um, um, and, they, would, and they would change it like, yeah, every two weeks. So, and you got no choice because uh, you got no backup. 
but know that it's going to do a number on your pineal gland. It's going to num do a number on your circadian rhythms. Increase your level of stress, increase your cortisol, then you get sick. Thymus gland. Thymus is very important. And we're going to learn it in uh, next term in immunity. Um, maybe you guys heard of it, your T cells, T, T helper, T cytotoxic cell or CD4, CD8 cell. Your T helper cell is big in AIDS, HIV. It's what the HIV virus loves to attack. So they're made in the thymus gland. Um, we know ovaries are considered a gland because they kick out estrogen and progesterone. Same thing with testes, of course, with testosterone and dihydrotestosterone. We have several digestive glands we're going to learn next term. They, of course, uh, produce hormones to regulate digestion. And remember, you go to buffet or you eat, Try this tactic. Eat only half. Wait 20 to 25 minutes. Right? You're, got, you're not going to be as hungry as you were it goes, if you eat the whole thing. Because how long does it take for the satiety center to realize that you're full? It can be anywhere from 20 to 40 minutes. So um, these digestive glands, these hormones, it takes forever to get the signal up to the brain and then to come back down here to tell you what. And by the way, once your nervous system kicks into play and tells you that you have a tummy ache, that's already too late. Um, because if your stomach is already distended and you can't breathe anymore, um, you definitely eat way too much. Heart, of course. Your heart has um, uh, natriuretic peptides and naturesis, think what? Na plus sodium. And we already know that uh, the role of sodium. What happens if I have... Uh, a lot of salt. Wherever salt goes, who follows? Water. Now, if I have a lot of salt in my system, I have a water in my system. What happens to the blood pressure? Goes up. What happens to my heart? It now has to work harder. So it's pretty smart how um, the heart, if it's, starting, if it's starting to work too hard, it tells the kidney, hey, throw out some sodium. Because man, there's a lot of pressure up here. I got to get rid of some of that stuff. Um, kidney, of course, uh, is kind of considered like a, a glandular, glandular thing, and we're going to talk more about the kidney uh, next term. Erythropoietin, erythropoiesis, we learned that in uh, bone. What's erythropoiesis? What does it do for the red blood cell? It makes red blood cells. So kidney, it's smart. The kidney has all this blood going into it. So who better than to tell the bone make more make more blood than the kidney? Stress and its effects, stressor, of course, there's psychological, physical, and that's where you get like, you know, your, your virus, your cold. Uh, again, extremes in temperature, but many times there's a lot, there's of course life, there's a lot of psychological stress. Your body doesn't distinguish between these two. It sees it both the same, and it will release cortisol uh, both the same way. So how does stress work? You have your GAS system, which is your general adaptation syndrome. Syndrome means sin, means all the same. Drome means following together. So the first thing is, of course, fight or flight. When you're scared or in a fight or both, you have sympathetic, uh, sympathetic impulses. We already know that. Increased blood sugar because of who? Epinephrine, also known as adrenaline. And all of these we talked about before, right? So think the first thing that happens to you when you're stressed out is epinephrine. Now, if this stress doesn't mitigate or go away, what will happen? You'll have the cortisol pathway increase. So what's going to happen? Increase of cortisol, increase of glucagon, because I need what? Long-term energy. The thing, but the thing that we now know about cortisol is that it will decrease my immune system. So, yeah, like a, uh, so um, here's a classic example. Let's say someone's being abused physically. Of course. As the initial violent act happens, you'll be what? Sympathetic nervous system, fight or flight. 
and um, um, the hormone in question is epinephrine. But what happens to someone who's been abused after a while? They just what? Take it, right? They just internalize it and they just take it. So now, they're not gonna get excited every time they get beat down. What's gonna happen? Cortisol, and then they get what? They get very, very sick. And there's actual signs and symptoms of this general adaptation syndrome for patients who have been stressed for a long period of time. And they look the same for a cancer patient. They look the same for an abuse patient. They look the same for a drug abuse patient. Because once you know and understand this, right? And it's also the same thing for drug abuse, right? The first time you ever take that drug, it's wonderful, right? You have that fight or flight excitement, but then after a while you'll need more. And then what's gonna kick in? Cortisol will kick okay? So you have the alarm stage, resistance stage. Alarm stage, think epinephrine, think all the things that are associated with sympathomimetic effects. And then longer stage, think what? My cortisol, which is my adrenal gland, and uh, oh, ADH and uh, renin cause water retention. Why? I'm in stress mode. I don't know what else is going to happen to me. I don't know when I'm going to get food. I don't know when I'm going to get oxygen or resources. So what's my body going to want to do? It's going to want to what? Hoard everything. And ADH and renin, they hoard water. Of course, after a while, what happens? That's when they get really sick. Then you have electrolyte imbalance. And you guys know uh, the synonymous with electrolyte imbalance. Of course, you're going to have musculoskeletal effects. But electrolyte imbalance, don't we have a whole bunch of electrolytes in my brain, my spinal cord, and in uh, all my nervous systems? So don't you think the exhaustion will also manifest itself psychologically? And of course, the one thing about cortisol that we don't like, well, we don't like when it happens naturally, which is the suppression of the immune system. And look at the effects are long term. And then um, actually there's a term for it in the, um, um, the Japanese are infamous uh, for working too hard. They work too hard, they also party hard. When I was with um, uh, WHO, uh, I spent some time in the, in the northern prefectures uh, in Japan. The one thing that made me nuts was their, um, their physicians and nurses do like 15 hour days and then they go party and then they go back to the ward and they're like, like nothing happened. But the Japanese, I forgot the word for it. They have a, they have a word. They're probably one of the few cultures in this world that have a word for being worked to death. And actually it is a part um, psycho, uh, uh, psycho mimetic. Because just imagine if you work, 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 and then party, work, party, work, what's going to happen? Eventually, you're going to what? Exhaust yourself out and then have a coronary, right? And um, actually, it's um, it's a very interesting phenomenon. Um, you also saw in um, the early 2000s a drastic decrease in the number of uh, teen suicides in Japan. Because why? They started telling the teens, stop going to school seven days a week. Stop going to after school. Um, I had a neighbor, Yuko, when she came here in the United States, she used to stay after school. Like um, my wrestling practice was like from 3.30 to 6.30. She'd still be there studying at 6.30. And she didn't have to, she had a stay at home mom. I'm like, what are you, psycho? What's wrong with you? You're already getting A's. You want more A's? Like how, what's more than an A, right? Oh, she continued that, she went to Columbia. Uh, uh, Columbia University after that, and then went to Columbia Law School after that. Do you think she ever stopped that? No. Like uh, I met her years later after law school. She was still a psycho, as in no life, everything for her job, everything for her boss. And I, I honestly think the boss was took total advantage of it. And yeah, she moved up the ranks and became a really good lawyer. But what good is all this money and 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 notoriety? if you can't enjoy it, right? And you work yourself to death. But I, I bet you anything, she's still in New York City. She's still working on, on that life. And um, uh, she had this beautiful downtown apartment. She was there, she goes, hey, you can hang out. I gotta go back to court. And I'm like, and I go, no, I wanna hang out with you. We're high school buddies. I'm like, 
Oh, we can have a couple of drinks. Yeah, we had a couple of drinks. Here, I'm going to leave you my keys. You can hang out. Why would I enjoy your apartment? I thought that was so weird. And then I haven't <laughs> talked to her ever since because I just like, you're a weirdo. And because why? Right? It gets a, it gets a hold of you. And when you look at residents, feel for them because there are times where they don't go home. I mean, for weeks. Uh, one time, uh, I, I think I shared this with this class. My record is 34 days. I did not go home for 34 days uh, during the tail end of my first year residence. That's how busy I was. So every time I sleep, I wake up, Dr. Grass, I sleep, wake up, Dr. Grass, and to the point where I almost got evicted because, you know, if you don't pay rent, uh, especially in Newark, they're going to kick you out. And then the, the landlord didn't see me in a month. Uh, thank goodness, uh, you know, um, um, I, I had somebody tell him, hey, he's alive. He's OK. Uh, please don't kick him out because uh, he needs some of his clothes. So lifestyle, endocrine, of course. Everything decreased. Growth hormone, of course, should decrease. Uh, that's uh, completely normal. But when growth hormone uh, levels decrease, how about muscular strength? Again, I mentioned uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger. You see, it goes uh, Sly Stallone. You see how huge they were in the 80s and 90s? You look at them now, you're like, they're still pretty, they're pretty big, but they got a lot, they got a lot of like missing parts. <laughs> ADH levels, of course, increase because what do you want to do, right? Uh, you want to try to hold in your water, uh, uh, especially when you get older, uh, because remember, our <clears throat> older patients are more prone to dehydration, and your body knows that. So what does your body want to do? Antidiuretic hormone. I want to keep. PTH levels drastically change risk of osteoporosis, especially if you had kids. Um, uh, they should say, especially in uh, mommies. Um, insulin resistance. Now, what's insulin resistance? Remember I, my theory about how I don't think in I don't think diabetes mellitus type two or non-insulin dependent diabetes mellitus is genetic. Because my theory is, who taught you how to eat? Right? Your family, right? And, um, and also uh, society. So if you live here in the United States where things are open 24 hours, um, you, um, uh, you can order things to your door uh, at all times, right? Um, what happens to the lock and key? Don't you think? If I use the key too much, don't you think I could burn the key, right? You know, if I keep on using it, what happens? The key could get destroyed. Or I could run out of keys. That's insulin. What else? The lock, the receptor. I open it, open it, close it, open it, close it, open it, close it. And I open it, close it too much because why? Because I don't eat this much, I eat how much? This much. Uh, remember I quoted um, uh, a good colleague of mine. She says 400 calories per day. And then when I tracked my calories, it was close to 8,000. So that's what? Seven times more. And that was me casually eating. I wasn't even going for the gusto. Right? Yeah. Like, you know, like how sometimes, like, okay, I'll take two big bags. You know, it's two for one. So yeah, it does. Uh, who's influenced for that? Uh, Burger King. How many times I'm like, oh, BK Double, two for one? I'll just eat half of it later. When, when you're not eating half of it later, you're eating what? All of it, two of them, now. Right, because this is America, right? Um, um, when I was a kid in the 70s, when uh, other family members were coming over, um, I came over in 72. My parents came in 69, and then I had other family members over the course from 70s, 80s come in. To really be honest, I never saw a fat Filipino ever. Right, but now I go to my home country. What do I see all day? Obesity everywhere. All my nieces and nephews, none of them are in sports. And this is the Philippines, because why? They now adopted what? On Philippines, you get you get all the food that you get here, and 24 hours, and delivery, just like here, right? If you're in a major city, and even if you're in the province, what can you do? You get some kid to do it. It's really cool. You go, hey, get away, right? Give him a, give him a couple of coins and go, yo, I need a burger. Yo. Where was a burger at? Oh, it's about three kilometers down, three kilometers down there. Hey, you got a bike? 
No, here. Here's the now five pesos. Get a bike, get me that burger, and I'll give you a whole two pesos later. Uh, at a rate of 52 pesos per dollar, I think uh, I think I could afford 10 pesos to make a kid uh, travel three kilometers for food. Right? Got hit by the bus, by the way, on the way back. He was okay, he lived, but he got my burger. He's limping in, he was like, oh, his sir. And I'm like, good on you, son, here's 5 pounds. Have a nice day. Don't let, any, uh, don't let anybody uh, take advantage of you, just like I did. But you can see how easy it is. So if it's that easy, just like here, right? Like because of the, the pandemic, it's now it's so addicting. We had to put a ban in our home on DoorDash and all that stuff. Because we were like, you know, I started noticing that it wasn't me ordering all day, but I'd order for breakfast, and my wife would order for lunch, and then one of my older kids would order for dinner, and then one of my other younger kids would order for snack. You know that snack, which is, snack is what, 11.30ish around there, right? Uh, and then we're not even getting out of our house. There was a point where it was really disgusting. And then we were, there was a point where we were eating on a cycle, like, a pizza, hot dog, burger, pizza, hot dog, burger. Now, I'm like, okay, we got to out cook because this is out of hand, right? Uh, and that's where you get this insulin resistance. And it's in every, and it's not only us, we can easily say America, we're fat, we're nasty. We can easily say that. But every industrialized nation in the world has the same problem. Because, so that's something that, we, uh, that, that's not only lifespan changes, that's also a significant, and now we're spreading this culture to other cultures. Um, uh, all, um, all, all around the world. Because I, re I remember when I was a kid, I like uh, my meals were like nothing, like barely about maybe half, half a cup of rice and maybe some fish or whatever. Now I look at my meals, I'm like, oh, that's a lot. And they go, that's a lot of meatloaf. And did I have to put all that gravy? Yes, I did. Right? And what did it do? Insulin resistance. So now I had to do what? Change my lifestyle. Changes in melatonin, also changes in lifestyle. Um, when I'm in the Philippines, uh, I see a lot. I goes, I I see a lot of my um, other colleagues, my other other teachers. They barely work 30 hours a week, barely. Uh, and my counterpart, when I was a dean, I talked to uh, my counterpart at a local boys uh, uh, boys school. Uh, it was in one of the provinces. She was like, Oh, I only have to come in three times a week. And I go, Excuse me. When I was a dean, I worked seven days a week, 16 hour days, right? And my school only had, what, 1,500 students. So you can only imagine if you have 10,000 students, 5,000 students, and you're a provost, like you'll never go home, right? So what happens to that melatonin? What happens to that lifestyle? Not never ending work. And also, uh, have you guys heard of the term affluenza? Mm -hmm. Right? So what is it? What does affluenza do? Oh, yeah, I thought you said influenza. Oh, no. Affluenza, <laughs> Aff something who's affluent, right? Especially those of you who came here from other countries, right? What happens, right? Because when you first came here, you were happy with what? I'm just happy if I have this job. If I have this job, it's good. Then you get an apartment. Oh my God, I'm happy with this apartment, right? But then you're like, that condo looks dope though, right? And it just got a pool. But then I want a house with a pool. Then I want what? Not one car, two cars. Then I got teenagers. Now I need four cars. So do you see this, right? I got. Um, uh, uh, I have family members like uh, that. They work seven days a week, two different jobs. Why? Because they get they buy a car every year. Not a little car. Like um, I have uh, a med tech cousin in, in Indiana who's addicted to Porsches. He got two girls going into college, and he keeps on buying a new Porsche. Go say, hey, check it out. Cayenne S, 2021, and I go, oh, how's Alyssa supposed to go to college? And he goes, well, that's her problem. But like, look, Cayenne S. Um, he only came here 12 years ago. And when he was here, he was just happy having a med tech job that paid more than minimum. And now he's a supervisor, now he's got all these things. Now he's looking at his house like, he goes, no, I'm going to Aspen next winter, so I got to do a couple extra shifts. And I'm looking at him, right? And I've told you guys the stories about what when I was in the corporate world, when are you going to have time for your kids? When are you going to have time for like all the other things? So don't you think that will increase your stress, decrease your melatonin, right? And of course, thymus over time. 
Who here didn't get sick when they were kids? Right? My wife was one of these people. I think the first time she got sick, she was in her 30s. She never got sick, right? But now, uh, um, she had kidney stones, and, and she had a panic attack about five, six years ago. And then now she has these weird upper respiratory tract infections. Because why? Your thymus, is it going to be up here protecting you all day, every day with your T cells? No. Over time, it's going to do what? It's going to decrease. So over time, especially if you have your, a more geriatric patient, are you going to bring your great granddad to the mall? No, don't bring him to the mall. Don't bring him out. You bring him to family things, you do what? Semi isolate them, right? Because the more exposure they get, can they defend themselves? They can't. And that's a problem. Oh, like uh, this morning when I went, to, I went to the dollar store, someone brought a newborn to the dollar store. Does a newborn have any thymosin? Does a newborn have almost any immune system? No. So why in heaven's name are you bringing goes a, I don't know, it looked like it was eight days old. I'm looking right at it going, that's a beautiful newborn. And um, there's a lot of nasty things in this place. Because it's a store. It's full of dust. It's full of things. And now that I have a mini mart, my own mini mart, now I know exactly how many nasty things are in there. It's only the first week of my mini mart and I'm seeing gross things, right? Again, all of this put together is your endocrine system, and uh, it goes, it's a signaling system. And the um, signaling systems, you have a nervous system, fast or slow? Nervous, fast. fast. Long acting or short? short? Short. Endocrine, fast or slow? Well, no. Relatively slower or slow. Long acting or short acting? Long acting. So now that you know this long acting, don't you think the deficiencies in the endocrine system will be long acting as well? Because those of us who have any nervous issues, right? Maybe you get a little tick. And how many of you got a little tick? Every once in a while, you're like, your arm or your butt does this, and it just goes away. And you're like, cool, I'm just going to ignore that for today, right? But if you have an endocrine issue like hypothyroidism, is that going to go away anytime soon? No, you're going to feel it. You're going to gain, you're going to have that weight gain. You're going to be sluggish. You're going to be sleepy all the time. So let me stop the recording because that's the that's the lecture and I'll make